Now this doesn't count part of my time, so okay. So without uh, delaying this any longer, uh, we've got some great speakers here, and uh, from from Kathy Braun, Phil Wedden to I mean, uh, last year, I mean, I thought I thought having um, the Lancers MVP for the last 50 years or whatever it was was amazing, and. Um, but this year, uh, we're very, very lucky. Um, literally, and I don't know how many people know uh, or are in tune with U.S. soccer, but um, if U.S. soccer had a Mount Rushmore, <laughs> this guy's head would be on the top of it. <laughs> I don't know how much rock that would cover, but it would be good. <laughs> and if you think I'm kidding, I think about three other icons you can put there with him, and it's pretty tough to say. Uh, Tony DeChico has been the U.S. Women's National Team coach from 1994 to 1999. In that time, he won 103 games, nearly 90% of every match. He compiled a total, a total record of 103, 8 and 8. He led the U.S. Women's Olympic team to its first ever gold medal. I don't know if they give you a gold medal as a coach, but I think that's awesome. Additionally, he led the U.S. to win the 1999 FIFA Women's World Cup Championship in, the, in a dramatic finish over China. He was inducted into the National Soccer Hall of Fame in 2012. He's a Hall of Famer, and he's here. <laughs> he was the head coach for the U.S. U-20s Women's National Team, where they won 2008 FIFA U-20 World Cup Championship in Chile. He's the only American coach to win the Women's World Cup, the Olympic gold, and the U-20 Women's World Cup, where he remains to this day the coach with the most victories. Tony is the only, excuse me, he coached the U.S. goalkeepers in the first edition of the FIFA Women's World Cup in 91. He's the CEO and founder of Soccer Plus Goalkeeping School and Soccer Plus Field Player Academy, which is one of the clubs that we endorse more than any club, in, I mean, any other camp out there. He coaches the Boston Breakers in the Women's Professional Soccer League from 2009 to 2011. You might have seen him just recently on TV as the analyst for NBC during the 2000 Olympics and ESPN during the 2003 and 2007 Women's World Cup. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud and honored. Please give me a warm welcome for Tony Chico. Well, thank you very much. First of all, thanks for the invite up and all the ha hospitality, Jim Davis and, and Beth and Pam, and, uh, and of course, Claire and Chris, wonderful hospitality, and thank you very much. My wife did come up with me, but she fell in love with the town of Clinton, so she headed out. She's been to a few of these, you know. <laughs> she said, I'm gonna go find the church, and then I'm gonna check out the town. And I hope I don't offend anybody. So I said, fine, dear. No problem. Um, so look, I've, I've listened here uh, and I've talked to, uh, since I've been in, I've talked to Jim and Chris and Claire, and you got something pretty special here. You got a club that's a community. You got great leadership within your club. You've got a philosophy in your club. And, and, and I can tell you, because one of my companies is a consulting business for clubs. And many clubs, their philosophy is, we don't want great to get in the way of good. They've been doing it for so long, and it's good, and they just don't want to make the steps to make it great. And I, what I see here is a philosophy that works. It's about the players. The players are the, the centerpiece of the, of the club. It's about the level of coaching you have and the coaching education that goes on. And then it's about player development, okay? And this is, my, my background is a teacher. So in my camps or when I coach my national teams or, or my professional teams or my club teams, I'm very big on the total child. Because we have a great vehicle, we have a great sport to teach the game, but more importantly, we can teach character traits. 
And uh, this is what I see in this uh, club. So you should be very excited about where your children are because they're gonna get good uh, instruction. They're gonna be uh, taught as the total child, not just a soccer athlete, and it's pretty important. So, you know, I don't have a chance often to um, speak to just parents, and I know there's a few players here, but we won't count you guys. So I, I, I think I'm gonna start off with a true and false quiz. So you have to, after I finish the sentence, I'll say true or false, and then you have to respond, either true or false. And I think you'll get all these answers correct, because they're not that difficult, and some are, you know, obviously a little facetious, because I, I think the club has guided you to what's important as far as your child's development. So here's the first one. If my child does not play every Saturday and Sunday, they will fall behind. True or false? False. Very good. I know. I know you're. <clears throat> excuse me. I know you're afraid of making a mistake here, but yell it out. Okay. <clears throat> false. They won't fall behind. In fact, what I tell my parents in our club is, look, if we don't play on Sunday, I know it's going to be traumatic for you because you wake up in the morning and the first thing you say is, "When's the soccer game?" Okay, it's a two. All right, this is what we'll do in the morning, and then this is what we'll do after the soccer game. And without the soccer game there, you may have to figure out your day and do something without soccer. And, and it's great because you can do it as a family. Okay, so you did good on the first question. Here's the second one. <clears throat> Is it really important to ask your child, what did the coach say at halftime and what did the coach say after the game? True or false? False. False, very good. And we're not getting a 100% participation, but you, you get the idea. Look, and, and coaches, what I do with when I coach a team is I bring the parents in after the game. Come on, I want you to listen now, because the last thing your kid wants to hear you say is, what did the coach say after the game? You know, and if you ask that, you know what type of answer you get. You know, probably nothing. Or, you know. So, Bring your parents in, they hear, then they don't have to ask. All right, here's the next one. You're doing really, really well. <clears throat> and I don't know if the coaches at Odyssey do these recaps. My guess is they do. Our coaches' recaps of the game, basically the day after, the two days after, they send out an email recapping the game, what we did well, what we need to improve on. Our coaches' recaps of the game, what we did well, what we need to improve on, really important to read. True or false? True, especially with the coaches here, okay? <laughs> All right, you're doing good. Um, <clears throat> is it important for young players to learn every or most positions? True or false? True. True, it's really important. I can't tell you how many times I, when I was coaching a national team, went up to a player and said, hey, Kristen, you, you want to try you know, I, I've got a lot of forwards. I really like your qualities as a player. You want to try right back. Oh, no, no. I've never played there. I can't play there. I don't want to try it. Okay, relax, relax. You just walk up to another player and you ask her. And, you know, Kelly O'Hara is a perfect example. Kelly O'Hara was a um, Herman Trophy winner out of Stanford. She, been, as a forward, scored many goals and I'm sure has many Stanford scoring records. She played every minute of, for our Olympic team this year is left back. Okay, so learn every position because when players go from one team, whether it's their high school or club team, and they go maybe to the next level team, ODP or college, whatever it might be, that coach may see them in a different position. They need to have all those positions. So as the coaches move your child around, that's a good thing, that's a good thing. Um, oh, here's a good one. If your child teams win, it doesn't really matter how they played. True or, oh, you're getting that quick, okay. Because <laughs> sometimes I think parents feel like, you know, if we win, doesn't matter, we won. And if we lost, my child's soccer career is over. <laughs> All right, last one. Oh no, I have two more. I help my child by yelling tactics and instructions from the sideline. Good, good. I even like you laughing at that one. All right, here. <clears throat> the best way to support my child's soccer 
is to show passion for the game and ask often, are you having fun? <laughs> you guys are all A students. All right, that wasn't really my speech, so let me get on with that. But I wanted to celebrate what you're doing here as a club because it is important. You know, I've been around the game a long time. I've been involved with youth soccer and at all levels from, you know, youth soccer to ODP to, um, you know, Olympic national team, professional. And it isn't done that way, often enough um, and well enough. And that means we aren't teaching the total child. We're winning at all cost. I'm going to put my studs down the center of the field and, and I don't care. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to do that in a big game, but you don't need to do it in every game because that player that you might take off the bench and put in there in two or three years may be the stud on your team. So you're doing it well here, Odyssey. Keep up the good work. All right, so really what I want to talk about was peak performance, achieving and sustaining excellence, and achieving ultimate success. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about this with your, um, your, the players tomorrow. Because when I talk about ultimate success, there isn't any organization, team, company, that sets their goals to be almost successful. Nobody sets goals to be, let's almost get there. Let's almost reach our target. Everybody sets goals to be ultimately successful. Now, why do some groups reach it, some teams reach it, and why do others fall short? So I've had the luxury of, you know, getting an education by coaching some of the greatest players that ever coached, uh, that ever played the game. Um, and I was able to coach some of the great teams. And yeah, I've had success as a coach, but, you know, my success was based on the level of player I had. And, and understand, I didn't say talent. They were talented. And this is something I'll tell your, your children tomorrow. Talent is not enough. All of us in this room have grown up, the kids down the street, I can remember two or three kids around my neighborhood that were more talented than I, I was. But talent isn't enough. It's a great thing if you're willing to work, put in the effort, do the little extra, get yourself around the best, observe, watch, and then maybe that talent kicks in. So here's the first thing that I have found with great teams, great organizations, sustained excellence, you know, organizations, teams that have sustained excellence, it's leadership. You have to have leadership. Um, and it's, and everyone in that team, and I'll, I'll just use team here, everyone in the team has to know their role in leadership. Not everybody can be the captain. Everybody might want to be the captain, but not everybody can be the captain. Some will be the captain or co-captain. Some will be the cheerleader. So uh, when I coach the national team, you may recognize the name Julie Foudy. Uh, she's on ESPN a lot. Um, Julie was the cheerleader. She was like a co-captain. And she was a leader, but she was a cheerleader on the field. She always kept everybody either laughing or inspired to play, whatever it was. And then you had somebody like Christine Lilly. Her, her method of leadership was just the way she worked every day in practice, her, her level of consistency. She was a role model for everybody else to try to emulate what she did. Um, and our number one leader was Carl Overbeck. Now I've also, and she was our captain, you've never heard of Carl Overbeck. Anybody here heard of Carl, Carl Overbeck? A couple of you. Good, thank you. I'll mention that the next time I see her. Um, <laughs> but she was the number one leader of all that team, the Mia Hams, the Michelle Akers, the Christine Lilly, the Brandy Chastains, the Julie Foudy's. Carla Overbeck was the leader of that team. They all looked up to Carla. And, um, and here's the other thing, and I'll have a story about Carla in a second. There can be negative leadership. I'm going to use names here. I won't use them if I tell the same stories tomorrow with your children. But Kelly O'Hara, who I just spoke about, and I think she just played um, up at, uh, in Rochester. Uh, she plays for New Jersey, and she played up against the uh, uh, Western New York Flash. Um, Kelly was on my 2008 U20 team, and she was my leading scorer, but I had to cut her because she was, her leadership style was so negative. She was undermining everything I did. She was intimidating her teammates. And finally I had to say to her, I said, you know, I called her up. We were down in Mexico. We, we qualified for the, the World Cup. 
we lost in the finals to Canada in that qualification. And, you know, I tried to talk to the team afterwards and everything I said basically got back to me that she was, oh, this is why we lost and this is why we lost, and this is why we lost. Anyway, I had to call her up and I said, Kelly, I'm cutting you. And she said, whatever, and hung up on me. But she called me back and she goes, I know I have to change my attitude. And I said, Kelly, I love what you do on the field. But the bottom line is we have three more events before we go to Chile. And right now, this team can't win with your leadership because it's negative. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell Pia Sundhager not to, to look at you because I think you should get a chance to play on the national team. So I cut Kelly O'Hara. And I also cut another star in that team, Casey Nagaro, who's the most talented player on that team. Not for the same reasons. Casey was a great kid. First to help with all the equipment, um, but she was, you know, improving by little steps. So I had to cut them both. Um, but the good news is, when Kelly O'Hara was a free agent, after the first year she played in the league and out in the West Coast, her team folded. And she was a free agent. She came to play for me in the Boston Breakers. And I called her up and I said, Kelly, I got a spot for you. Are you interested? I didn't know if she'd hang up on me, but she actually had a better offer somewhere else and came to play for me. And so that told me that even though it was painful for her, and I was cutting my leading score at the time, it also, she understood that it helped her. And uh, I'm very, very proud of her um, because she played every minute in the Olympics as a left back, and here she was, a big time scorer. That's negative leadership, and we'll get those types of players. And we, if we have the time to work with them and try to um, help them be positive, we need to do that. In that case, I didn't. But let me give you an example of really positive leadership. Carl Overbeck, uh, when I was in the 1999 World Cup, and I don't know if, I know we, Claire and Aaron were at the Foxborough venue, but I don't know if anybody was down in Washington, we played Germany in the quarterfinals. When it, was anybody there? Okay, the stadium was full, 65,000. Uh, Germany, by the way, won the next two World Cups, so it was a really tough uh, quarterfinal opponent. And in the first five minutes of the game, Brandy Chastain scored an own goal. You know, she, you know, everybody understand what an own goal is. She kicked it. You know, she was chasing the ball in towards our goal, looking over her shoulder. She went to pass it back to Brianna Scurry. Of course, Brianna Scurry was calling for the ball, sprinting out for it, so you can imagine what happened. I don't remember it all because it took me a while after I passed out to come to it. <laughs> but, you know, it was an own goal. And, and we went on to win the game, and I didn't know the whole story at the time, but after the World Cup, Brandy and I were doing some clinics out on the West Coast, and a young, you know, we had the kids seated at the end of the clinic, and one of the young girls raised her hand and said to Brandy, what was your favorite moment in the World Cup? Now, if you remember, Brandy Chastain scored the winning penalty kick in front of 90,000 people in the Rose Bowl, I don't know how many million watching on TV, to win the World Cup. I mean, I, this is an easy answer. Brandy paused for a second, and, and she didn't say that answer. She said, my best moment and my worst moment were about 20 seconds apart. My worst moment is when I scored the own goal, and she explained it. And as I started to walk back upfield in a little bit of a daze, the best thing that happened to me in the World Cup happened to me. And that's when my captain, Carl Overbeck, came running up to me, looked me in the eyes, and said, Brandy, Brandy, we've got 85 minutes. We'll get that goal back, but we need you to play. Let's play. Now, if you knew Carla, she probably really wanted to go up to Brandy and grab her around the neck or something. but. Carla was a great leader. She understood that her teammate needed support. She understood that we're not gonna beat Germany with 10 players and one hiding from the game. And she understood the competitive dynamics of what was required. And she brought Brandy back into it. And the, the punchline is really, we were down 2-1 in the second half, and Brandy Chastain scores the tying goal. And then we go on to win. I don't think she scores that tying goal without that leadership, that moment of support and compassion and leadership. That's the type of leadership we're trying to build with our players, youth players or national team players. Leadership is a component that every successful team has. It starts with the coach and the captains and the key players and we need to celebrate positive, good leadership as often as we can. Another thing that teams have that are, you know, sustain excellence 
that are always either winning championships or nearly winning championships is they need they know how to deal with failure they know how to deal with failure and we call this uh, failure as fertilizer so you can kind of sense where that's leading because we're all going to fail we're human beings everybody human here just checking um, we're all going to fail one time or another and when you fail you the worst thing is fear of failure if you can if you can understand that you will fail and when we tell players hey the worst thing in the world if you're a batter in baseball if you hit 300 you're great that means you failed seven out of ten times if you're a striker in soccer and you can score you know three or four out of ten you're pretty awesome but that means you fail more than half the time so you, you got to be able to deal with failure and in, in 1995, when I first took over the team, and if you remember, I took it over from Anson Dornish, who's a legend in the game. Um, we went to Sweden in the first World Cup. It's me as head coach, and we lost in the semifinals to Norway. And uh, you know, Norway was the better team. We lost 1-0. It was a close game, but they were better. But at the end of the game, I saw something. And it was, you know, over the next day or two, no one was pointing fingers. No one was saying that Chico didn't really coach that well this game. I didn't think I coached that well in that game. I don't think my subs were good. Nobody said, we lost 1-0. We got Mia Hamm, the most prolific goal scorer in the history of international soccer. That may change in a little time when Abby breaks it, but she's got a score in these, in these games. Nobody accused that of Mia, but if you talk to Mia, she probably would have said, I need to score in this game. Nobody went up to Brianna Scurry and said, you know, you cost us the game because that six foot three Viking woman who out jumped you to head the ball in, you know, but if you talked to Bri, she would have said, I needed to get to that ball. So that was the first thing I, I saw. Nobody pointed outwardly, everybody kind of looked internally and basically said, I could have been better, I should have been better, I will be better next year for the Olympics. And then the other thing that I saw, which kind of unfolded over time, was the motivation from failure. The motivation from failure, isn't that a great thing? And, it, you know, I'd be running them hard in training and they'd be bent over, you know, resting for the next, uh, you know, suicide or whatever. And somebody would say, remember Norway. And all of a sudden you'd see the body postures change and they'd get more upright and they'd get after it. It became motivation. In fact, the last thing, when, when I resigned from the team, um, at the end of 1999, <clears throat> and that was the toughest decision I ever made professionally, but it was either continue to coach internationally and lose my family, or you know make a big boy decision, and you know I had four sons. That's probably why I coached women. We, we don't want to get into that, but um, I had four sons, I had an unbelievable wife, and I was just away too much. Um, but the last thing I said to him, we were out at Nike campus in Beaverton, I said, remember these three things. Remember how it felt when they put the gold medal around your neck for the first ever Olympic gold medal women's championship. Don't ever forget that, that's great motivation. Remember how it felt when you won the World Cup in the Rose Bowl and now you were Olympic champions and World Cup champions at the same time. Don't ever forget that, that's great motivation. And the third thing I don't want you to ever forget is that evening in Yavla, Sweden, when the final whistle blew and the Norwegians celebrated and we all slumped to the ground. Don't ever forget that because that's great motivation. So we need to turn failure into fertilizers. The great teams, the great players do that. We have another expression on the team. Chemistry is a verb. And what we mean by that is when you join a team or an organization or a club, and you've got it here because of the number of volunteers that, are, that you have, uh, it's fantastic. But when you join a team, you have to make a contribution to that team. You need to input your personality, get to know other players. It's one of the hardest things, especially on, on girls' teams. You know, they, they have their friends and, you know, it's hard for them, especially in a club like this where players are coming from different towns. Guys, we're kind of blunt instruments. If you can play, I don't even like you, but I'm, I'm glad you're on our team. It's that sort of thing, you know. <laughs> Girls need to have relationships 
so that they can maximize their ability to play on the field. <clears throat> I learned a lot coaching women, let me tell you. <clears throat> so it's a, con it's a contribution that we ask everyone to make, you know, and what I call it is support coefficient. So in my 2018, when I took over that, that U20 team, it was in shambles because the World Cup in Chile was right during the NCAA tournament. So the college coaches weren't supporting it. They didn't want to send their best players to Chile when they were going into the NCAA tournament. Um, the team was good, but was missing something. I happened to go out and find Alex Morgan, not a bad pickup. Um, and, but, and then I cut the two stars of the team, okay? But once I did that, the chemistry of that team changed. And I had three great leaders. Becky Edwards, who played up at Western New York a couple of seasons ago, Nikki Washington, who played for me in Boston, and Keelan Winters, who played for me in Boston. They're all playing in the league now. I think, in fact, two of them are playing for Portland and one is playing for Seattle. They became, their positive leadership took over. And now this team became in, un, incredibly close and supportive. And when you have that support coefficient, and what I call it, when a player walks on the field, they're not thinking about making any mistakes. They're not thinking about, oh, she doesn't think I should be starting, she should be starting. All they're thinking about is playing towards their trademark skills, playing towards their trademark skills. And when we went in and played in Chile, it was phenomenal to watch them and everybody played to their level, but it's because of the support on the team. So chemistry, it's kind of an overused word in sports, but it is important and it's a verb. It means every player has to contribute to it. Catch them being good. <clears throat> That's actually a, the title of a book I wrote with uh, my sports psychologist, Dr. Colleen uh, Hacker. But the story behind that is, and this is probably to the coaches as, as much as to the parents, the story behind that is we were in China. We were playing China, uh, Norway, and Sweden, three of our biggest rivals. You know, it's a four nations tournament. They, I think China does it every year. And we won the tournament. In fact, we didn't even concede a goal. And we played awful. We played awful. These teams had all brought in real, this was like 98, so it was a year before the World Cup. Or it was, yeah, it was a year before the World Cup. And they, the other teams were bringing in young players to try them out and everything. And I just got frustrated by the way we were playing and crossed the line. I got negative with the players. And so finally, and luckily, I always had an open door policy. Carlo Overbeck and Julie Fabi said, hey, can we speak with you? We were still in China. I said, sure. Are you going to cut, and this is their conversation to me, are you going to cut us and bring in young players like these other teams are doing? I said, no. We have the nucleus that's going to win next year in the World Cup. There might be some challenges. Players are going to be challenged by some young talent. But no, we have the nucleus. So you're not going to cut us? No. Then stop yelling at us. So I had crossed the line. So two weeks later, we had a training camp at the Olympic Training Center in Chula Vista, south of San Diego. So I brought the staff in, um, and I said, look, here's how we're coaching this week. If you see the traditional way of coaching is, you, know, you see something, a mistake, freeze. Okay, let's, uh, instead of making that pass, let's drop it off here, then we'll find that run. Okay, let's restart it. I didn't coach that way at all, and my coaches didn't coach that way. Instead, we own, if we saw a mistake, just bit our lip. And we waited until we saw something good. And then it could be something like, Christine, that is a great run. If you make that run, you're tearing the defense apart. That's why Tiff was able to get into that seam. And, it, and she'll score from there. If you make runs like that, selfless runs, she'll score from there. So that's the way we coach for a week. And catch them being good. That's the, that was the motto. And um, at the end of the week, Julie and Carl came in again. And this week was so much fun. I don't know if they just enjoyed being out of China and San Diego or if they really noticed the difference. But from that day forward, it's been a part of my coaching. That doesn't mean I don't correct mistakes. I still do. But I make sure that we celebrate good play because I found this out. When you catch them being good, it spills over. Everybody enjoys that. The whole team enjoys it. It lifts the whole team. And then it's just a much more positive way of coaching. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I also say to my players, catch yourself being good. Because players are generally hypercritical, especially female players. 
Again, us guys, we don't make that many mistakes. <clears throat> you, you know the story, I tell the story, you know, I'm like if you were all my team, and you were a, all female players, and you were my team, and I said, ladies, we got a little bit of a fitness problem here. All of you would think I was talking to you. Oh my God, coach doesn't think I'm fit. Now, if we were a whole bunch of guys, and I, and I said, hey guys, we got a little bit of a fitness issue here. All the guys in the room would say, Coach is right. I'm the only one fit. These other guys better get off your butt. <laughs> so women internalize everything. <clears throat> but I do want them to catch themselves being good. And uh, it's, you know, I say that confidence is an inside job. Doesn't mean, as coaches, we have to help them build confidence, but they also have to have that responsibility. The last thing that I ever said to um, the players, or they read before they went out into the field, and this is, this is my national team, Olympic gold medals, World Cup champions, U20 professional youth. I would write, if I had, if I had you know, a flip chart or whatever I wrote on, play hard, play fair, play to win, and then in capital letters, have fun. Because at the end of the day, it's a game. And if we can instill fun in the game, they will learn more, they will enjoy it more, we will enjoy it more, and, and um, you know, everybody wins. So we're not gonna win every game, but if they're having fun, we're gonna get a lot done. I'm a camp director now. I'm not coaching professionally any longer. I hope to be coaching again. If anybody has any coaching jobs, let me know. Um, <laughs> But um, I'm not coaching right now, so I basically leave June 1st and travel for about 12 weeks uh, and, you know, be going through Hamilton, New York with uh, Colgate. And my camp philosophy and my coaching philosophy is basically the same. I challenge. I challenge the athlete. But the key is, it's got to be a real challenge. It can't be a token challenge. And Chris, who's worked the camp, and some others that have attended the camp, it's gotta be a real challenge. And then the key is, when you challenge your athletes, then you guide them to success. You make sure they're successful. So if you challenge them and then guide them to success, what you do is you build self-esteem, you build self-confidence, and there's a direct relationship between self-confidence and performance. And that's kind of the basis of my coaching, is you know, we're gonna challenge you, but then we're gonna make sure you're successful. And from there, you're going to see what you're capable of doing. So we hope to see some of your children at camp this year. But um, more importantly, I want to thank you for inviting me here, for the hospitality, um, and for you know getting a real sense of what the Odyssey Soccer Club is and where they will be. Thank you very much. Okay, so please sit down, I'm gonna go my part two of my speech. <laughs> Chief, put the heckler back there. Um, guys, I, I wanna, uh, I, we brought Bill and Chris up here, and uh, we wanna thank Tony once again for coming up here. This this is, uh, again, an awesome, awesome event that, that uh, that we, we really are proud of, but to have you come here makes it just that much more special, and we're, we're very thankful. And as you guys can see, I mean, uh, this is this is not just about you know um, you know us coming up here and just celebrating what we do just as a, on a small scale. I mean, for for me as a coach, uh, I, I love this piece because uh, you know every day I'm trying to absorb and absorb more and absorb more, and just sitting there like at the edge of my chair, like I'm looking at the top recruit. I mean, I was excited to hear everything you had to say, and uh, we're very thankful, and on behalf of the club, we want to present you this gift, and uh, we really appreciate you coming out.